The black and white, clear as crystal. Movie theaters face existential threat from the cough without new movies. It's over. Greetings all, this is Jake S. Weissman here with some new movie news. I don't know how these endorsement things work, but hey, Dollar Shave Club, why don't you endorse me? Pay me or shave me. What a buttery smooth glide. So deep on my news feed below John Wayne and Star Wars news and lots of Tom Hanks, Spielberg plot twists, a couple new trailers, and the Hamilton polka. There was one article yesterday where I said, yes, this is something. And that's the LA Times talking about the existential threat that movie theaters are facing right now. And let me tell you something, I've been talking about it for a minute. So it's nice to see a major publication say something. I'll put the link to the article below. It's by Ryan Founder, it came out yesterday, July 11th at 9.46 a.m. I figure I'll just read through this and give some commentary. I won't read the whole thing. Uh, but I definitely have things to say about it. After months of being shuttered, Texas movie theater chain Alamo Drafthouse published a blog post from founder Tim League, essentially saying that its theaters would be safer than a supermarket. Supermarkets aren't particularly safe, and they are essential. So I wouldn't compare the two. This is something I've been finding a lot where people are saying, hey, you're more likely to kill yourself than get the cough. Well, I don't need you to tell me that I'm more likely to kill myself than get the cough. Obviously, that's not news. So don't tell me that it's just as safe as something else because nothing's really safe right now. You're telling me that this is safer than going to a concert. Well, I'm not going to a concert. It says 1,300 domestic movie houses are currently open, including 293 drive-ins. But the vast majority of the country's nearly 5,550 indoor theaters remain shuttered. While drive-ins are doing brisk business, indoor theaters are struggling to draw audiences because of lack of new Hollywood films. That's what I was saying. If there's no content, there's nothing for anyone to risk going to. So have fun showing your classics, but I would rather watch it on my TV. I feel like most people would as well, so it's time to start listening. 20 days ago, I would have said we're on track, says David A. Gross, head of movie consultancy, franchise entertainment research, but this latest spike is just awful. I know, I don't know why anyone thought this was gonna get better. We've been talking about second waves. I know we're still in the beginning of the first wave. Since this started in March, there's kind of been this understanding, at least amongst the people that I talk to, that this is gonna continue throughout 2020, the summer is going to be one thing, and then the autumn is going to be a totally different thing. There are some major releases still signed up for September. Uh, that being said, Conjuring did move and Candyman moved. That's a big sign. I was saying Candyman was, was going to be a concerning thing. They're pushing it, but only about a month. So we'll see how long that sticks around. Studios, meanwhile, are dealing with their own dilemma of when they can safely start releasing blockbusters again. Yes. Christopher Nolan's Tenet, originally expected to open July 17th, has been delayed until August 12th. Walt Disney's Milan was pushed from July 24th to August 21st. Once those releases were postponed, theater chains adjusted their own schedules. The AMC Theaters, the world's largest chain, delayed plans to open until July 30th after previously targeting July 15th. In the current rise in cases, there's no guarantee those new dates will stick. I will repeat, and given the current rise in cases, there's no guarantee those new dates will stick. Meanwhile, that's AMC, lucky AMC. My independent people here in Chicago are having a rough go. The people who wanna come out will come out, but there's some interesting things happening. Not the least of which is uh, the Music Box Theater is offering a $10 raffle. Give them 10 bucks, you get a ticket, you might be able to win an opportunity to have a private screening in their small theater for you and 10 of your friends. It's a really great idea, but that's also a sign that things are not going very well. They wouldn't be offering that opportunity if they were making the money that they needed to be making. The sustained closures are taking a huge bite out of the theatrical movie business, effectively quashing the traditional summer box office season that normally accounts for 40% of annual ticket sales. Wedbush Securities estimates that North American box office will total $4.4 billion 
in 2020, down 61% from last year. Our whole industry is caught in the middle right now, says Chris Aronson, president of domestic distribution at Paramount Pictures, which plans to release A Quiet Place Part 2 in early September. It says here, the president and chief of the National Association of Theater Owners, yes, they are called NATO, and yes, they do have their convention, their annual convention at Lake Geneva. So there is a NATO Geneva convention. John Fithian, the president and chief executive of NATO said his organization has been encouraging the studios to start releasing their big movies next month, even though places like LA and New York remain in a state of uncertainty. So why would they be pushing that if they didn't need something? The vast majority of global markets will be open in time for the current release dates for Hollywood movies. He says other countries he noted have been more effective than the U S in controlling the and for a movie like Tenant, two-thirds of the box office is expected to be international. I think that's really interesting. If everything opens around the world and we can't because we're not handling the cough effectively, I wonder how people will react to that. How an audience will react to Asians and Europeans and Africans and Australians and everybody being able to watch new Marvel movies. But America can't. We're a little up our own ass about that kind of stuff. So I'll be very curious to see how that plays out. Let me tell you, if these guys can make their money, there's not going to be any hesitation. They will drop this in Asia and every other continent if they can make their money back finally. The question is, if they can make their money back internationally, can they get away with just dropping it on streaming? Most of them don't want to do that. They really don't want to do that. That's giving a big leg up to streaming over the theatrical experience, which everybody is trying their damnedest to save. Furthermore, if studios don't start releasing new movies soon, it could do lasting damage to the industry. If the answer is, we're going to wait until 100% of theaters are open, and we're not going to be there until a year from now when there's a vaccine, Fithian said, this is existential for the movie theater industry. If we go a year without new movies, it's over. If we go a year without new movies, it's over. This is the head of the National Association of Theater Owners. The president and chief executive of the National Association of Theater Owners saying, if we don't drop movies soon, movie theaters are done. The business will fall out. Oof. Releasing a big movie during a pandemic will be risky, especially for the first major titles to hit theaters. Nonetheless, Nolan, an ardent supporter of theatrical exhibition and film studio Warner Brothers, have remained determined to chart a successful theatrical release for Tenet. That bothers me. That's always been bothering me. I don't think that the grander... I'm a broken record. Nothing is worth the safety. Yes, I would love to see your movie that's shot on film in a movie theater. That is the way the experience was born. That's what we want. We're living in a new time. Film and movie theaters will survive. It's just gonna have to change. It's gonna be a little different than it was. There must have been some guy saying, no, don't do projectors, ugh. The Nickelodeon, that's the only way to watch a show. Put a quarter in, you have your own private little silent show. Woo! They're killing the movies with these theaters. What are you gonna do? Movies killed vaudeville. Right? Movies got started in vaudeville. After the Nickelodeons and everything, they and they figured out the projection system, they would put these on at the end of vaudeville shows because all anyone wanted to watch was the movie. So if they put the movies at the beginning of the show, the audience would leave before the live performance. So there would be a live performance and then it was up to the programmer to put on X number of shorts and people went crazy for them, and that's why they're called trailers. They trail the show. When vaudeville was done, trailers at the beginning of the show. We see this as an important time to work with exhibitors to figure out how to be healthy and responsible at the same time, said Jeff Goldstein, Warner Brothers Pictures president of domestic distribution. We're being smart about it. Vague. I can just trust that you are being smart about it. Studios say they're ready to release films when health officials give them the green light. The first wide release picture to hit theaters will be the Russell Crowe thriller Unhinged, expected to debut on July 31st. After that, Sony Pictures is set to unveil the romantic comedy The Broken Hearts Gallery on August 7th, my birthday. Neither is expected to grow significant numbers compared to blockbusters. They will provide 
the first true test of audience's comfort levels. It's a bad first test, because on a good day, those movies wouldn't do well at my theater. My regulars would come see it. Unhinged would have an awful weekend. Comparing this to Tenet or Mulan, it's not even close. If they're really testing audience comfort level with these films, we're a long way off. Once theaters can open safely, there's plenty of products, says Tim Rothman, chairman of Sony Motion Picture Group. It's not a chicken and egg situation, it's a safety issue. Well, I'm glad that he's saying that. It's very true. Once we can do it, we can do it. But the holdout of all of this is trying to save the theatrical experience. Trying to save that window. And they are, oh, I gotta tell you, they're a, I don't know, what's a good metaphor? They're a cruise ship taken on water. For the theaters reopening, can't come soon enough. The largest chains, AMC and Regal, remain shuttered. Cinemark opened a handful of theaters, but most won't open until after July 24th. I wonder if they got any of that PPP money. Because my independent friends don't have the luxury to wait until August. Some smaller chains that tried to open early by showing recent releases, like the Vin Diesel action thriller Bloodshot, and nostalgic classics including Jaws have struggled to make ends meet with those titles. What's worse, exhibitors' expenses have increased with the introduction of new sanitation equipment, protective gear, and cleaning protocols. Oh, really? So the budget for sanitizer and masks and gloves has gone way, way up, and there's a lot less people going to the movies. So already, that's not including food that could go bad. That's not including anything that expires. That's lost loot right there. Illinois-based Cinema Classics opened its 13 locations in the state on June 26 with a lineup of retro screenings. Ticket sales popped the first week, but attendance quickly fell. CEO Chris Johnson decided to close the theaters again on Thursday. That's brutal. That's so brutal. The older movies just didn't necessarily cut it, Johnson said. And you can only have so many showings at Jurassic Park and Harry Potter. At the end of the day, our livelihood is new movies. We're going to make sure the new releases are set in stone before we get excited. I feel for this guy. He spent a lot of money to reopen because he had to reopen. And like he said, Jurassic Park and Harry Potter ain't going to cut it. Brock Bagby, Brock Bagby, executive vice president of B&B Theater, said he's faced a similar problem. The Liberty, Missouri-based chain has opened its top 16 locations, but the theaters are only doing about 10% of their normal business. He says that he and his dad recently watched Jurassic Park in a 130-seat auditorium with eight people in the theater. Oh, man. That's 100 bucks in tickets. That's 100 bucks in tickets. They probably made 200 bucks. And I don't even know. Maybe if it's eight people... I don't know how much the tickets cost. That's being generous. His original plan was to reopen five or 10 theaters a week, but the delay of new releases scuttled that process. When the movies got pushed, we decided to take a pause because it just didn't make any sense. That's what we were saying, right? We're totally reliant on these release dates. And when the release dates change, you make all these plans to open up your theater and then you got nothing to show but Harry Potter 7, which everyone's seen 100,000 times and you're not gonna pay full price for that. Oof. Theaters have already started releasing spots showcasing their cleaning and social distancing protocols. Cinemark released a three-minute video demonstrating the company's contactless ticket thing. Demonstrating the con <laughs> Cinemark Cinemark released a three-minute video demonstrating the company's contactless ticketing and entry sanitation equipment and concession workers behind plexiglass barriers. That just reads as money, 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 money. The video costs money. Ticketing costs money. Sanitation, concession, plexiglass. Money, 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 money. Even in places where regulations loosened early, some theaters have held off. Florida theaters were allowed to open with 50% capacity in June. However, the Tampa Theater, a nonprofit movie palace built in 1926, decided to remain closed. Because its single auditorium seats 1,200, there's no way to open sustainably while also keeping customers safe. Even by reducing capacity to allow for distancing, said the president and CEO John Bell, getting 600 people through the theater's lobby before showtime would be too dangerous. We could probably do more if we could magically teleport people to their seats, Bell said. So even if you can socially distance, 600 people in a lobby is no good. And as far as magically teleporting people to their seats, I'm pretty sure that's what streaming is. Sorry. 
Part of the uncertainty for cinema stems from the fact that some states haven't given clear guidance about when they can reopen. Maryland, New York, North Carolina, New Mexico, and New Jersey have so far not given reopening dates for cinemas, according to NATO. After struggling to get answers, the theater owners... Association, along with several major theater chains, on Tuesday sued New Jersey Governor Philip Murphy. The group's complaint said theaters were being unfairly discriminated against in the state, where religious gatherings are permitted with 25% capacity, or up to 100 people, whichever is lower. So we're getting to that point where theater owners are saying, hey, if church can be open, why not the movies? I don't have a good argument to or fro. I don't think that... Groups of people should be in doors together <laughs> right now, whether it's your religion or the palace of the cinema. I understand these guys are hurting so bad that they're willing to sue the governor to open their theater to try and get people to sit down and watch Harry Potter. It's still unclear how eager moviegoers will be to return to cinema, according to data from Screen Engine, 13% of frequent moviegoers say they plan to return to theaters right away no matter what's playing, while 29% said they will go when there's a movie they're interested in. Still, 18% said they plan to wait until the cough is completely over. Frequent moviegoers are those who go six or more times a year. Frequent movie, frequent moviegoers are those who go six or more times a year? Every other month? Oh my god. My regulars? Five times a week, six times a week, see this stuff again and again and again. Come five days a week and do double features. So I don't, I honestly don't know what that means now. <laughs> I don't know what any of those percentages means because I, these frequent moviegoers are not my frequent moviegoers. I guess that means it's, it's worse. Is it better or worse? I'm so bad at math. I didn't get into this business because of math, you see. Consumer concerns have increased significantly since the recent cost spikes, particularly among women and older audiences, said Screen Engine Vice President Catherine Powera. It's really all about safety, Powera said. If you look at those who are really concerned, what the data says to us is that movie going is on pause. So what the data says, studio executives, However, are confident that new movies will be able to turn profits once they hit cinemas, though they'll have to say goodbye to the $100 million opening weekends that summer blockbusters used to generate. Studios hope that a lack of competition lets such films as Tenet and Mulan play well into the fall. That would make a sharp contrast to the pattern for summer movies, which normally do most of their business in the first couple of weeks. When there are fewer movies in the marketplace, you can go for a much longer period of time, Goldstein says. It's not about the first day, the first weekend, or the first week. It's about taking a really long view of it. <laughs> That's how it was for a really, really, really long time. Gone with the Wind is the most successful film of all time because it was in theaters forever. The Godfather was really successful because it was in theaters for years. Star Wars was in theaters forever. The long, the long con used to be how movies made money. It wasn't that long ago. It's only until recently that there actually was a summer blockbuster season that it only mattered in the first weekend. The weekend is all that matters and then it's done for. That's only in the last few decades. It's really funny to watch these people kind of relearn this stuff because they've never seen it in their lifetime. It's always been about the numbers of the opening weekend. It's true. At my theater, you can gauge how a movie's gonna do over the weekend based on the Thursday night preview or the Friday night screenings. It forms a pattern for the rest of the weekend. And that weekend always does better than every other weekend. There's a couple of times where it'll get a different kind of momentum, but that's because my theater was a little different. I don't think it usually played that way in the AMC. The difference is that my theater had four theaters, so we had to get rid of the movies faster. At an AMC, a movie can play the long con and be kept in theater 14 for months and months and months. Congratulations to The Rock, who just passed some sort of milestone because of Jumanji 2, which has been streaming for a really long time already, but its box office is still doing stuff. I'm sure a bunch of these theaters brought back Jumanji 2. So we'll see how this plays out, how this long con actually works. Uh, if people start planning budgets and planning their films for 
several weekends instead of one because everyone's going to have to figure out when they go to the movies. You can't just shove into the theater when Black Panther comes in and, and everybody has to go see it for the first two weeks. I'm really interested in that. I'm concerned about how deep the audience is, Gross says. I don't think anyone's ready to let go of 15% to 20% of the audiences. She's talking about the studios. If they open, it means up to 20% of the audiences will not come. And they're not willing to risk that into their equation. Like I've been saying since the beginning, these are giant investments. They need to make their money back. And that's what it comes down to. That's the money. If you put in $100 million expecting to get a half a billion back, you're not just going to give up 20% of a half a billion. 20% of a half a billion dollars is $100 million. The $100 million opening weekend is what everybody wants. That's a lot of money. If your movie could make $100 million in its entire lifespan, that's incredible. So to be throwing that away is a big, big, big choice. Studio executives said they're impressed by the level of detail in exhibitors' reopening plans despite some controversies. AMC chief executive Adam Aaron initially said the company would strongly encourage but not require patrons to wear masks unless uh, mandated. He quickly reversed course. Now they have to wear masks. That's just studios saying, hey, we trust theaters. Go see the movie so that studios and theaters can make money, please. Thank you. B&B's Bagby said he's heartened that audiences who have braved his theater so far have given rave reviews about their experiences. The people who have come out to the theater are very appreciative of what we're doing and the measures we're taking, Bagby said. Hopefully people are going to get more comfortable and get acclimated to going back to the movies. Yes, that's a very nice way to end this article. It's the only way to end this article. That's it. Don't expect anything to change. And don't expect these movies to come out especially if the cases keep trending the way that they are. Definitely, movie theaters are definitely facing an existential threat. They've never shut down like this. There's never been anything like this before. The great hiccup, the only hiccup that was needed to transform the movie experience from theaters to streaming. Oh, shout out to Dave Hoffman. Hey man, it's always good to hear from you. And as always, thank you for your specially in <laughs> And as always, thank you for your special insight, Hillary Strohshine. The song of the episode is the Beatles, only a northern song. This is my favorite deep cut from the Beatles. What's your favorite deep cut? I rock out to it all the time. It's on the Yellow Submarine album. People don't really talk about it. It's a great George song. It's a lot of nonsense. Play it loud. The book of the episode is courtesy of my mom, Gigi Weissman. It is Star Trek The Next Generation. What would Captain Picard do? Captain's orders from the USS Enterprise. I can only assume that it was written by the man himself, Captain Jean-Luc Picard. This is an annotated version. I got it for my 30th birthday. It still has the original post-its. Uh, my mother used it as a card signed by my niece and sister. And, uh, and, and more, I've said this more than once, that so much of what I've learned from management came from Star Trek. And a book like this will just remind you so many different things. There are four lights. Control is merely an illusion. Listen to the concerns of your crew. It's just great. And if you're lucky, you'll have the post-its from my mother uh, where it says, it's crucial that one maintains a sense of mental well-being when on a mission. Indeed. Indeed. Pick up your copy of this or just watch a shitload of Star Trek. I recommend both. <laughs> the movie of the episode is Michael Mann's Heat. Because if you haven't watched Heat, I need you to watch Heat. Every movie has ripped it off. You're doing nothing right now. You should watch this three hour long epic crime drama that inspired your favorite Batman movies. Please. Just do yourself a favor and watch Heat already. You've been putting it off. You don't need to anymore. You have all the time in the world. Soak it in. It's really good. Not a hot take. Pun intended. I have a fun show coming up soon. I'm working on it right now. It's an interview video podcast that I'm doing with some friends of mine. 
uh, where we talk about the ins and outs of things. I have an episode with Luke Taylor, producer, screenwriter, director of Break, coming up soon. So keep your eyes open for that. Please check out my Screenplay Diary show where we will write a screenplay together in real time. It's like a gameplay let's play, but with screenwriting. Sit through the next couple of seconds, get the little, there's the videos that you can click, and I will talk to you the next time that I talk to you. Click the thing. Click the clock clock. Click the clock clock. Click the other thing. Click it, 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 click the video. Click it. Is that a Long Island iced tea? Oh, this? Hmm. I think it is. Hmm. You're a pretty girl.